Henny. Hi, how are you? Hi. Good. So, this is 8.15 on Thursday the 3rd of September 2020. And that sound was Henny just arriving at my front door and giving it a good knock as we start off on our weekly walk to Sainsbury's. This is something that we've been doing ever since the start of lockdown for the coronavirus at the end of March. So it's now been over five months that we've been doing this walk. And Henny arrives every Thursday at this time, knocks on my front door, having walked from her own house, and then we both set off together to walk through the Queen's Park estate to Sainsbury's to do our supermarket shopping and also to do a bit of shopping for some of our neighbours who aren't able to come out so easily. So during this walk, um, and I'm delighted that you're joining us for once, this is, makes it a bit unusual for us, I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are, so you can picture where we're walking, a little bit about the background of the area that we're walking through, because it's quite distinctive, and then Henny's going to talk about walking during the pandemic and just how that has been changed and our attitudes to walking and the sort of things that we do while we're walking. So to start off, we're in Lothrop Street in the Queen's Park Estate. So the Queen's Park Estate is um, a collection of 20 roads in um, northwest London. It's the northwest bit of Westminster. So it's a little further away from the Queen's Park Station and the Queen's Park and the Queen's Park area, which are um, north east from here. And we're the other side of the railway tracks from this. So the estate was built in the 1870s and early 1880s. And it was built very much with the design of creating an estate of houses that would be decent homes for working people. It was built by a company called the Artisans and Labourers General Dwellings Company. And the name pretty much says all about it. it. Links into an Act of Parliament in 1875, which was designed to provide better quality homes for working people. Um, and that it was triggered very much by the huge influx of people coming in from the countryside into all of the big cities at that time, um, reflecting social changes, the development of industrialization, and they cr cr came into the big cities and the housing stock was pretty dreadful at the time. Lots of slum conditions, overcrowding, uh, bad sanitation, um, and therefore lots of disease, early mortality, all of the problems that are associated with that. So these were built as little cottages and it's small terraced houses, two up, two down, but they're quite distinctive. Um, a lot of them have archways above the doorways um, or other little shapes, some of them have gables, some of them even have turrets. Um, and the idea was to really make something that was attractive and pleasant and a nice living condition. Um, the, ha the rooms inside are nicely proportioned. There aren't many of them. Most of the houses are two bedroom houses. Um, a few of the grander ones are three bedroom. Um, but they have large windows, they have small front gardens, and they have larger back gardens. Um, there are decorative ironwork um, railings on the um, window sills, and there would also have been on the front um, walls of the gardens as well. So the area is distinctive um, and very special to those of us who live here. There are 20 streets in total, there are six avenues, and they are numbered 1st Avenue, 2nd Avenue through to 6th Avenue. And they run by and large north to south. So um, the north of here is Kilburn Lane and south of here is Harrow Road. And then the other streets are streets and they're arranged alphabetically. So starting with A, Alperton, Barfit, Caird, Embrook and so on. 
Um, initially, they were just called by their initial letters, so A Street, B Street. But as we understand it, it was the post office that said that that was too confusing, and so they were given actual names. Though we don't know at all why the names were given to any of the streets. So Alperton, that's an area, a suburban area northwest of here. But then Barfoot, maybe it's a person's name, same with Caird. Kilravik, it's a place in Scotland. Marne, a river in France. Peach, well, that's a fruit, could be a person's name. It's, it's all a bit vague. Um, so they, they go um, from Alperton A through to Peach, that's the last one. There was never a J Street. Um, and F Street, Ferrand Street, was demolished in the 1970s. At that stage, the houses were in quite a bad state of repair. Ferrand Street wasn't particularly worse than any of the others. Um, a lot of the streets, a lot of the houses had, had suffered uh, bomb damage during the Second World War. The estate is between the main line heading out of Euston and the main line heading out of Paddington and we're not far from the Kensal Green gasometers. So the area would have been a target area for German bombers. And indeed, some of the older people in the area remember having to go into the air raid shelters in their back gardens night after night, which must have been extremely grim. Um, so by the 70s, there hadn't been a lot of investment. They were in quite bad state of repair. Um, they all had outside toilets still. There was even a plan to demolish the whole estate. Uh, fortunately, that didn't happen, although one section was taken out to make way for the development of the Mozart estate. But at that time, Farrant Street was removed, and in its place was a garden. So actually, we benefited it in the long term. Um, of having a lovely green space in the middle of the estate. The whole area has a really strong sense of community. Perhaps how it's been developed and the fact that we have small cottages. People generally, when they come out, you say good morning to people in the street, you say hello to your neighbours. But during the pandemic, that sense of community has become much, much stronger. Of course, we all came out on Thursday evenings at 8 o'clock and we clapped to show our support and our appreciation of the efforts of the NHS people and people in other key worker roles, whether it was in care homes or rubbish collectors, street sweepers, people working in supermarkets, cleaners, all of those people were doing to make our lives safer and easier during the particularly the early time of the lockdown. Some people worked in preparing meals for people who were elderly and self-shielding, who were ill, and that was a big community project of local residents doing things for other local residents, and hundreds of meals were prepared each week for that. Some people were also working in the um, the Queen's Park Gardens and doing gardening during this time to keep the gardens looking beautiful for the benefit of other people. Weeding, watering, um, planting, pruning, all of the things that are needed to keep a garden um, under control. Um, there were in the early days, there was much less traffic on the roads, so kids were out playing, they were drawing hopscotch designs on the pavements, which to me really takes one back to an earlier age, probably how it was, certainly in my childhood, and perhaps at the time when the estate was first developed. And people used to meet with neighbours and friends. We were physically distanced, but socially connected. So people would come and stand in their doorways or even st sit on their doorsteps and friends and neighbours would come and stand by the garden gate or on the pavement or sometimes even bring chairs and sit and have conversations. So as I say, physically distanced um, but uh, socially connected. So that's been a, a really lovely part of this really difficult time and let's not underestimate how difficult it's been. One of my neighbours was seriously ill with COVID-19 in hospital for weeks and weeks on end 
and it was such a relief when she came home. So we've now turned into Fifth Avenue. This is the, the largest, widest and grandest of the streets on the Queen's Park estate. Um, and it's the one with more turrets uh, than any of the others. So the whole estate is a conservation area, but here on Fifth Avenue we have a, a stretch of it which is also Grade 2 listed. And what's interesting is that they put turrets on, but they didn't make them all the same. So they work in pairs opposite each other, but then at the next street corner there'll be different style of turrets. So hopefully you can picture a little bit where we're walking at the moment. Um, just to tell you also, it's a rather grey morning <laughs> and the wind is blowing a little bit. Um, but it's fine and it's, at least it's not raining. So now I'm going to hand over to Henny, who's walking next to me. And she's going to talk a little bit more about other aspects of walking. Thank you. So we've been walking this route, which is about... I think it's about, for me, I'm, I live a little bit further than Allison, so it's about a four mile round trip. And walking has really, the art of walking has changed completely. So I'm a very fast walker, as is Allison. And I've always walked quickly. I've walked in a straight line. I've been usually thinking, daydreaming, and just thinking I'm going from A to B. How quickly can I get there? And now that's wildly different. So what happens now in, in the art of walking is we are very much more conscious of other people around us. I can't be daydreaming anymore <laughs> because I'm thinking who's in front of me, who's next to me, is there someone behind me? And in that consciousness of thinking about who's where and who do I need to move away from and who's got a pram because I need to move into the street if someone has a pram or anything on wheels, as people do for me when I come back from my shopping with something on wheels. And so the connection is now stronger in some ways with people because we're always watching each other. If someone coughs, I move away. If someone um, is jogging behind me, I also move away. I find that I'm walking in a zigzag fashion, you know, fashion instead of a straight line. And that's, um, I don't know how much of that's going to change. I'm hoping that at some point we'll be able to move more quickly and not be as worried. But I have a feeling this is going to last even, even beyond um, any kind of vaccine. So I think the art of walking is, is changing. Um, there's much more thank yous and smiles, much more social connection when we're walking as well as people move out of each other's way and say thank you. Um, and I find that that's quite, quite interesting as well. So that's the, that's the art of walking. It's now, it's now zigzag. <laughs> also, the question is, where do you walk? So this trip that Allison and I take, I've been to that supermarket, but because it's two miles from my home, I used to take the bus. <laughs> now we're walking. And I find that my, my way of getting from any point A to any point B is quite different as well. So Google Maps is my very good friend. I check... When, when lockdown started, we checked what's around our neighborhood, visited places I've never been to, discovered parks I've never seen before, which were like a mile away. Um, and now, anywhere I want to go, I check, how far is that? And I see that there are places that are two miles away. Um, I think uh, Hampstead Heath is maybe two miles away from me, so I've walked there. Uh, Oxford, Oxford Street is almost three miles away. I've walked there. Um, the Chinese supermarket I go to is uh, about three miles away. I've walked there. So the exercise, question of taking exercise by walking, and where I can walk to, the picture of London has changed. So London is now a place I can do lots of walking to, and that's been, um, that's been interesting as well. So I think that in the future, I will probably walk to places, maybe take, take public transport back. But it really changes the face of a city when you think about it as a place you can walk as opposed to a place you can, that's a bus going by, as a, you know, opposed to a place where you can just walk versus transport. 
So talking about transport, you might have heard that we are now onto a busier street with more um, traffic around. We've um, walked down Fifth Avenue and turned onto the Harrow Road. This is a main arterial road um, coming through from Harlesden in the west through to Edgware Road where it then connects up with um, Marlebone Road and then on the Euston Road. Um, so a fair bit more traffic here. So we've just crossed the road um, onto Harrow Road. There are buses and um, cars. In the earlier days of our walk, there was much less traffic, but that's now built up uh, over, the, over the months. And we're, we're coming up now to the, the edge of um, Westminster with the junction with Kensington and Chelsea and Brent. So Brent goes up to the north, Kensington and Chelsea goes down to the south and a little bit to the west here um, because it includes uh, the Kensal uh, Green Cemetery. And this is where we will then turn onto Ladbrook Grove. On the right hand side is the old telephone exchange building and then just beyond that on the corner is St John the Evangelist um, and a 19th century church. Sorry, we're just negotiating around the bus stop at the moment. Where a bus, the number 18 bus to Sudbury is heading off. This is one of the busiest buses in the area and one of the things that we've noticed over the weeks is the number of people who are on the bus. It's quite a busy bus normally. And the number of people who are wearing masks, which is um, a striking thing for us and, and links into our own feeling of safety of um, getting onto public transport. So we've now arrived at the junction and just crossing the road here, taking care as we do, so sorry I'm slightly distracted by the practicalities of walking um, as opposed to the spirit of walking. We're now just waiting for traffic to pass. So this is the top end of Labrook Grove and it's actually quite surprising that it comes this far north because it's come over the canal and the railway bridge. That's us across the road now. So we've turned left into Ladbrook Grove. And as I said, this is now Kensington and Chelsea for a very short bit of our journey. And you can hear the traffic around us more now. So now we're heading to the very last bit of our walk, which is the bit that takes us over the Grand Union Canal. And we cross the bridge and we're now turning right along the canal for a little short distance. And then we're now turning left around Sainsbury's. And in the early days, this was always a moment of trepidation because in the early days, it would be a huge long queue that would uh, stretch right back through the car park of Sainsbury's as far as the yard with the gasometers. And we turn the corner and, with a bit of dread as to how long the queue was going to be. Fortunately, that has completely changed now, and certainly at the time we come, we don't have to queue at all to get in. Of course, the other aspect of trepidation was about what we would find once we got into Sainsbury's, and how many shelves would be empty, whether there be toilet paper or plaster or flour. And um, some of the neighbors that I buy food for would be surprised when I say no, there was no yeast again. I'm very sorry. Sugar? No, no, no sugar. <laughs> and I've got you this sort of pasta. There was no spaghetti. Fortunately, that has also changed um, over the weeks that we've been doing this walk. However, this is still a period of coronavirus 
and we're still having to follow measures for our own safety and the safety of others. So this is the point where we put on our gloves and put on our masks, ready to go inside the supermarket. And therefore this is also the point where we're going to finish the walk um, so that you don't have to hear us um, talking through muffled masks. But it's been a pleasure to have you. It's been an interesting experience for both of us yeah. to walk along um, with my phone between us, um, with um, some stares from people as we pass them, as they obviously think we're a little bit loopy. Um, but um, it's been interesting for us, and I hope you found it interesting as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.